All right. So the dynamics of the Muslim community in America are very complex and I think in order to really understand it and put it into context we have to look at how did these places really develop and most of the people came here not because they wanted to necessarily leave their countries but they left their countries because of the political, social, economic oppression that they faced in those places and the lack of the ability to climb up the ladder without you know cheating or getting involved in corruption and doing things that they probably didn't feel were morally acceptable so people came to America for a lot of different reasons some of them came for money some of them came for education again some of them came fleeing war poverty political uh, economic social oppression and so the people that came here they didn't have the idea of I'm coming to America to make sure that somebody named Nick accepts Islam and we know how important intention is in terms of our deeds being accepted and if we're going to worry about our intention for any deed we should worry about our intentions for the very existence of us inside of this country first and foremost and I'm not an advocate of people to all go back home but I am an advocate of people looking at and changing their intention for why are you here because you know really being in a, one of these so-called Western countries is a golden opportunity for dawah and reward you know you could really lay the foundation that Allah knows best years to come could produce hundreds of thousands of followers to the religion of Islam and so what, what happens is that again you have people that are living overseas I give the example of Egypt for example it's not rare to find somebody driving a taxi cab who's got two PhDs speaks multiple languages but he's only getting paid two hundred dollars a month and so coming to America is a very appealing opportunity because once they get here they could turn those educational degrees or you know they're hard workers they know how to pass exams and they can get you know they can get further education they can become doctors engineers work for big companies they get themselves a six bedroom house and a gated community with the nice cars and they're living the life you know in fact a lot of these brothers and sisters are living better than a lot of us who are indigenous here in the United States you know they're 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 doing great they're working for fortune 500 companies they're, they're doing nice for themselves and the the second thing that you have to consider is that a lot of times the people who are coming to the United States, they're coming with their Islamic perspective of what they got back home, which a lot of times might be influenced by culture, might be influenced by political movements and things of that nature. Also when you look at what the masjid looks like and represents in the Muslim world, a lot of times, people don't like me to say this, but a lot of times they're resting places for pigeons. Outside of the five daily prayers, there's no activities going on. There might be some tahfid halakat where a few kids are getting smacked around if they don't memorize the verses that they're supposed to do, but there's no real youth activities. There's no, you know, uh, intramural sports people can get involved in community barbecues and now some people would argue that well that's because there's already a society over there that's taking care of these things and that puts you in one of two positions either a you're saying that the society over there already takes care of that which we know that here in America it's not taking care of that so we need those things or if the masjid is providing those things we should provide those things here which everybody knows that that's not what happens and so the end result is that our misogyny in America have to look a lot different than what they look like back home. And this is a battle in every single community. Every, I don't know how many times I've been someplace and they either have a multi-purpose hall or they're trying to build a multi-purpose hall and they originally fundraise under the you know, banner of the youth, we care about the youth, we want to get stuff for the youth, and then it turns into a multi-purpose hall so that we can have akikas and weddings. Because culturally, that's what's important to us. And we neglect, a lot of people are in la-la land with regards to the reality of the country that you're living in. You know, uh, khatibs, young brothers that are coming back that want to reach out to the younger communities, they start talking about issues that the community is taboo for them. You know, like maybe homosexuality or, you know, drug use or pornography. And all of our kids are exposed to this. I mean, you look at statistics, one out of three kids in every high school is smoking marijuana. So if your kid isn't, the kid that he knows is. You look at statistics for things like uh, pornography and you, you don't even want to know about it. If your kid's got a Twitter account, he's exposed to this stuff. Um, boys and girls. 
and, and so if we're not creating a safe and healthy environment for the children, you're going to lose all of those kids. And I hear too often people like, oh, wait for the next generation. No, there ain't going to be no next generation. You're going to lose these kids. And the ones that are sticking around are kind of getting brainwashed by the generation that's here that know this is the way that the measure should look like. It's quiet, no women, no children. All you do is come, pray, read Quran, and go home. And so when you have these big centers, you know, this is a paradise for some of these people, you know, where they're able to do all of these functions. They have their guest speakers that they call in and fly in, and hey, it's looking great. But the problem that we have, by and large, in the Muslim community is that we're really good at building structures. We're very bad at building community. And we think that numbers means community, and that's not the, the, the reality. You know, we're talking about brotherhood. Brotherhood isn't just, you know, to couple Allah minna wa minkum, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, and then you get up and you go. You know, the Sahaba, they battled together. They, they you know, they went to fight Badr, for example. A lot of times people think like, okay, they just beam me up, Scotty, over to Badr. But, you know, you've lived in, in, in Saudi Arabia, and you know that going from Medina to Badr, that's a trip. And it's not a straight shot. You're winding through mountains. And that's not a day trip. That's, you know, going to take a long time for you to get there. So we think about the bonding experience that happened during this process, the campfires that happened during this process, the jokes they played on each other, that developing one another. You know, because Umar ibn al-Khattab, when asked about the credentials of some individual, you know, he checked the person and says, do you know him? And one of the things was, did you travel with that person? You know, did you do business with that person? So if we're not creating environments where the people can interact with one another, we're really not building those bonds of brotherhood. You know, we have to really work on building that sense of a community. And unfortunately as well, we, we've created this atmosphere in our Islamic centers where it's a place for perfect people. Um, you're either on what I'm upon or, you know, I'm going to, you know, throw it in your face. Um, and the reality is that even if the people that you are hoping uh, to be upon whatever you're upon, whether it's your cultural, ethnic understanding of Islam or it's your methodology, you're not going to get those people to come on board by being harsh and by being exclusive. You know, th that doesn't work with people. Allah says in the Quran that if you're too hard of hearted, that the people would turn away from you. Um, and so a lot of times we turn people away. People come to the mosque, especially converts, they got a difficult time because they don't speak the language, so they kind of feel isolated of the ethnic groups that are in the community. Um, they're black, so people don't give them salams, right? Um, they're, they're sisters that aren't dressed in the hijab that you would like to see. And it's like, wait a second, you know, the Sahaba didn't change overnight. Why are you expecting these other people to change overnight? We're not making halal haram. And we're not making haram halal. We're not changing the deen, but we're just having realistic expectations of knowing that I didn't get to where I am overnight. I don't expect you to get over there overnight. So what we need to be doing is telling people that, look, I know where you're at, and I'm here to help. And if it takes you 10 years to get where you want to go, I'm here to help. If it takes you three months, I'm here to help. I'm not here to judge you. But I'm here to tell you, look, this is, this is what Islam says, this is what is right, this is what is wrong, and you're going to have shortcomings, faults, and mistakes. Keep it moving. You know, but this whole message of you're perfect or you're out, you know, that's not, first of all, it's not Islam. Second of all, it, it don't work. It's not going to work with the people.